Okay. Now, hello and welcome to QI Talk Time today with Pat McCluskey and Gillian O'Brien. Today we're talking about categorizing pressure ulcers and staging of pressure ulcers. So our speakers today are Pat, um, sitting here beside me. Pat works down in Cork. She's an advanced nurse practitioner who specializes in wound care and tissue viability. And she's a member of a number of national groups and although her role as an ANP encompasses education, guidance, policy, development and research, she's, her heart really is at clinical practice. So thanks Pat for joining us. And we also have Gillian, who's an advanced nurse practitioner in tissue viability in Nace General Hospital. She specialises in wound and uh, dermatology care. Gillian holds an MSc in advanced nurse practice and a HDIP in dermatology and tissue viability. Her specialist interests are wound infection, chronic wounds, dermatological conditions, minor surgery, and pressure ulcers. And Gillian is a member of national groups pertaining to wound care and guidelines, and is passionate about patient-centered care and equity for access of all patients with wound and skin conditions. So thanks a million to the two of you for, for joining us today. So just a little bit of housekeeping um, for you all online. We will have time after the slides Today is your opportunity to ask any questions that you have for our two experts here that are with us. So if you have any questions, you click up on the top right-hand corner on the chat function, and you type in your question and just submit it. And we have time at the end for any questions um, to, to both of our panelists today. So the signed, you can listen to your computer, but also in the chat box, you'll see the telephone number to ring if you want to listen over your phone. And also, if you want to follow us um, for future WebExes, you can follow us on Twitter at QI Talk Time. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to, to the ladies here to bring us through their presentation. Okay, so one of the key areas, I think, in, in terms of pressure ulcer um, um, management is first being able to stage what you have or categorize it. Um, yes? Um, and the, the recent uh, national guidelines, uh, which we've been working on for the past two years, have come out with a definitive set of, of categorizing, uh, staging uh, terminology now, um, and that's what we're actually going to go through today, so that everybody across the uh, countryside will be uh, staging pressure ulcers in the very same language, and that way we can look forward in terms of prevention and in treating using the same baseline. I'll just hand you over to Gillian. Gillian. I suppose it's important to mention as well as a result of the work and past involved in as well is that we will now have a straight across um, reporting. So everything on categorization will correspond. So everybody's going to be reporting the same stages of pressure ulcers. So that's very important. There's work being undertaken at the moment to update how we report our pressure ulcers, and that, and that is due in the soon part, isn't it? So um, I'm happy to involve hugely in that as well. So that will mean that we're all reporting and we're all recognising the same thing. So for the purpose of this webinar, we're really just going to quickly um, re reiterate what pressure ulcer is, and we all know that it is really a, a localised injury to the skin under the underlying tissue, and it's usually over a bony prominence as a result of pressure or pressure in combination with shear. And we, we also know that both immobility and diminished activity are considered to be primary risk factors in pressure ulcer. And just briefly, this just a, a visual view of our different stages. So with our new guidelines, um, there's stage one, two, three, and four, um, and we'll go into those further just to briefly let you know. So stage one, nothing much really has changed from that perspective. It's a, a category or stage one pressure ulcer appears as defined area of persistent redness, non-blanching redness in locally pigmented skin, and it's intact, so there's no blisters, it's not opened, and it's usually over bony prominence. And it's just be mindful of the fact that in darker skin tone patients, it may appear as a persistent redness or you may have blue or purple hues. So just to be mindful of, of people with different skin color, that it may present as a different um, color than our normal white skinned people. So a category two or stage two pressure ulcer is where we have partial skin 
loss involving the epidermis, dermis or both. And the ulcer is superficial and presents clinically as an abrasion, a blister or a shallow crater. So if you have tissue loss and you can't see anything extra, it's a category two pressure ulcer. And then we move on to category three, and that basically is a full thickness skin loss involving damage to or necrosis of your subcutaneous tissue, and it may extend down to, but not through underlying fascia. So your ulcer may present clinically as a deep crater with or without undermining of adjacent tissue. And I'm going to let Pat skip over to the next slide because he'll be sick less than to me. Thank you, John. So for the full stage four uh, category uh, for pressure ulcer, very little is unchanged. Very little has changed. It's full thickness skin loss with extensive destruction, tissue necrosis, or damage to muscle, bone, or supporting structures. That's down to tendon, joint, or capsule. Undermining and sinus tract may also be associated with stage four pressure ulcers. And I think this is probably one of the key areas in terms of assessment, that we are absolutely sure that what we're looking at and what we're recording or reporting is exactly what we are measuring. So if undermining or sinus exists, then we actually um, make a, no a notation of that. The big change, I suppose, for us in terms of the new uh, categorization is the suspected deep tissue, deep pressure, and shear-induced tissue damage, depth unknown. Now, this is, in one sense, quite similar to what is on the European and the um, UPAP and, and um, uh, Pan Pacific and, and so forth in terms of, of, of the categorization that they currently use since 2014. The, the change is probably more in the language. So instead of saying we have a suspected deep tissue injury, we're saying it's a suspected deep pressure and shear induced tissue damage. Um, and this is for in, in individuals with non blanchable redness and proper maroon discoloration of intact skin, combined with a history of prolonged and relieved pressure and shear, that this skin change may be an indication of emerging more severe pressure ulceration. That is an emerging category, stage three or four pressure ulcer. And we just, uh, I suppose it is important that um, we write exactly, record in the notes exactly what we are, are um, observing. So the suspected deep pressure and shear induced tissue damage, clear recording of the exact nature of the visible skin changes, including recording of the risk that these changes may be an indication of emerging more severe pressure alteration, should be documented in the patient's health record. These observations should be recorded in tandem with information. So in, in isolation, um, it, it, it wouldn't work, but in tandem with information pertaining to the patient's history, of prolonged, unrelieved pressure and shear. And it is estimated that it could take three to 10 days from the initial insult causing the damage to become a stage category three or four pressure ulcer. And this is an example of how a deep tissue, a suspected deep tissue of pressure and shear in the skin has actually evolved into a stage um, four pressure or three four pressure ulcer. So just to be mindful, it's sometimes it always is with deep pressure injuries is what lies beneath. So sometimes what we see on the outside can take a couple of more days to see, but it can have severe impacts on our patients. Um, and again, this is an example of an Achilles, and it's at least a category um, stage three pressure ulcer. Again, it's covered by Eschgar, but if you look at the skin around it and the amount of damage there, we have to see that it is at least a category three pressure ulcer. And again, there's a lot of mix up between pressure sores and moisture lesions, so we just put up this slide to allude to the fact. Um, and moisture lesions um, can be scattered. They kind of have that kiss and cheek where if you put the clefts of the Botox together, you nearly, they nearly meet in the middle. And they can ulcerate and cause pressure ulcers. It's important to remember that. And, but, and, and their management is, very, is difficult, and especially if you have patients with episodes of clostridial difficile, um, or if you can't put um, a fecal management drainage bag in situ. So they're, they're a difficult um, condition to manage too, but it's important that you don't report these as pressure ulcers. So basically, they kind of come in, in, in existence with um, urinary or fecal incontinence, primarily fecal, really. But you can get them from um, excess moisture as well. And it's just important to note 
that you don't mix them up and report them with pressure ulcers. And again, a huge, um, a huge problem we have as well is medical device related pressure ulcers and about 34.5% of hospital acquired pressure ulcers occur in patients with medical devices. And what we found really interesting myself and Pat was at our latest meeting um, at the FSAP meeting up in Belfast was to know that, you know, um, um, what's her name, Joyce Black, Black. Joyce Black was um, talking about medical device related pressure injuries. And importantly, what we did um, find out is that a lot of the companies haven't um, extended their products, such as simple things like urinary catheters. So they were made back in the 70s and they haven't evolutionized to meet the needs of our pet populations now, as in di uh, di um, overweight patients. So the catheters made back then are still the same catheters made now, and we see a lot of patients with skin folds or with obesity getting these um, device-related pressure ulcers, also in intensive care units. So patients with medical devices really are very much at risk to develop pressure ulcers, and we see it a lot in the very young babies in neonatal units and the elderly patients as well. So it's, it's to be conscious of that, that we can um, give them severe damage with medical devices, and we need to watch that as well. It's very important. So I'll leave that back to Pat. I suppose it comes back to, um, you know, yes, there is a deviation, but this is in our national guidelines. Is in 2017, and so we will be expected to work because our standards will be measured according to our, our guidelines. Um, and a lot of debate um, took place in terms of, you know, I suppose stepping away from something that, you know, is global, um, but for, for very good reasons. Um, and, and until, I suppose, that discussion evolves over the next couple of years, our um, guidelines will stand. Uh, we will have four. Uh, stages of uh, pressure ulcers, we will have suspected tissue uh, and pressure, uh, she pressure and shear um, damage, um, but we won't actually classify that uh, um, other than the, the exact language that's in our guidelines. And we will not have an unstageable, so where we have necrotic tissue, a slough, we know that that is at least a stage three. So we hope this will be helpful in guiding our practice, um, and we're open to any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, that's brilliant. Uh, thanks a million to the both of you, Gillian and Pat, for bringing us through a very comprehensive overview there. Now, um, the chat box is actually very quiet. There's no questions coming in there at all. Um, so now is your time to anybody online. If you have any uh, questions for the Gillian and Pat, please do. Uh, jump in there and type them in the chat box function for us. So just uh, in terms of, you talked a lot about the classification system there, um, and I suppose one of the things people might be thinking is why is unstageable being removed from the classification system? If either of you want to take that question. Well, I suppose, um, and just as I said uh, there, uh, Rosie, in, uh, the, in, in reality, you know, it, 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 it's a little bit dangerous to have something that's almost unstable mm. because it, you know, you're putting something down and it can go down and be recorded as something unknown. Where so we know if you have necrosis, we know if you have plus, that there is erosion of at least mm -hmm. the top two, the third, top layer of tissue. So you can't really, it would be disingenuous to say that uh, it, it's non stable. Mm -hmm. We know it's at least the three. It may be more. I think that's where. They kind of unstable we came in, you know, could you class it as more than that? So, but to, the, in, the key word there is at least. Mm. Um, and I, I, I couldn't really interpret that enough, I think. And I think it, it's kind of like, it was like the get out clause. So, a lot of people and the community may feel as well that they may perhaps have got patients from the acute sector or vice versa saying unstageable. And then where does the ownership lie? Where does the accountability lie? And then where does the reporting lie? So because we we, we don't there's nothing to gain from capturing an unstageable, and where there's very much to gain from capturing at least a great tree that we know we've issues that we need to work out on. So I suppose from the patient safety perspective, we really had to you know affiliate a proper terminology to the extent of damage done um, in these wounds. And I think that was a cohort that was being just left to the side. Um, and I think it's important that um, that was our rationale for taking out that terminology. 
Okay, great. If any of you are still unclear about that, maybe just pop it in there in the chat box. Um, just in terms of that new staging system, how do you think that will reflect back on the ground for staff? What changes do you think it will make? Well, I think it would have an impact. And the first impact, and people will probably go on and say, oh my goodness, you know, because, it, you know, even though um, people have their own policies, so we have a national policy, a national guidelines, and then people uh, develop their own local policies. So most of us in 2014 adopted the 2014 guidelines, which had unstageable and suspected deep tissue injury. So, in a sense, you know, we're familiar with that language, but it now means all policies and so forth have to be upgraded. I think it is better, though, in terms of, especially with the suspected um, deep tissue, pressure and tear and tissue uh, damage, especially for that. And I think, I think this current terminology is better because, because it can take between three and ten days. Sometimes somebody is found at home, and what they have is bruising. So, if you were to, to go with the original, you could say suspected deep tissue injury, um, and the injury connotates a lot of concern. Whereas it could be bruising, it could resolve within 48 hours. Mm -hmm. um, so, I think this gives us a better uh, handle on being able to describe exactly what we see um, and then watch it as it progresses. Mm -hmm. okay. As some of you online are saying that you're having problems hearing, uh, our connection seems to be fine for some reason, I don't know. We'll, we'll make sure that we speak right into the phone. Um, a number of questions have actually come in there. Um, so, uh, one from Shania Denley, she's saying that she works in community settings and is there a pressure ulcer leaflet for the public to provide them with information and importance of early reporting of pressure ulcers? And it is actually in the post part of the HSE website and in the QI department there is actually a patient information leaflet. So if you go on to www.qualityimprovement.ie and you'll find the pressure yeah. 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 So there is there. a patient information yeah. leaflet, yeah. yeah. Okay, great. Um, so someone else, Sinead Dennehy was saying that actually they have one themselves that they're using which is they're currently going to update, which actually might be very useful to share uh, Sinead with the people in POTS, um, if you go onto the website, there'll be a contact detail there that would be useful. Uh, so we have Pauline Chapman uh, who is asking, what assessment framework would you recommend to use in adult hospitals? I, I, I presume you were talking about the actual risk assessment tool, yeah. um, and that's a, it's a very good question, and, and really. Um, we were discussing this earlier today, and we discussed it, uh, I suppose, last evening as well, because the, probably the one that's the, the most used is the Waterloo um, uh, system, and yet we know that it has many flaws. Um, in more recent times, the Braden um, has become the most popular um, uh, or the most, I suppose, credible um, uh, assessment tool. But again, an assessment tool is just that. It, it, it's a need to the assessment. Everything really comes back to how you do it, the consistency, doing it at the right time, um, and making sure that it's not just enough to have the risk assessment, but that we are making uh, plans and planning care in, in direct response to what we're actually finding. So, um, I, if I was to choose one myself, I would actually choose uh, Britain. And, uh, uh, and I think we're hearing now that in Scotland, um, that in fact, they have moved even further and, and gone into a tool called PERDA, um, which will be uh, accessible. Again, because they found there wasn't um, consistency in terms of the Waterloo, um, it wasn't being filled in correctly, um, you, know, you know, a series of different uh, uh, audits showed that people weren't using it, so for that reason, they looked at, uh, at a, a new tool. And again, like all, all tools, they're only as good as your user or what you do about them. And um, I suppose the key important information is, is that if your patient has any sort of lim lim limited mobility whatsoever, and um, be it in daytime or nighttime, because some patients don't turn at night, um, and you get that from doing a, a proper you know, assessment on the patient and talking to their family where they can't give the information, and acting on that information is the most in, in, important thing. And I think in some places the skin bundle eradicated in some hospitals, actually the, the, um, the Norton score 
braid and water low, whichever tool you use. Um, and again, um, I think that's the most important thing, that if your patient, oh, the name of the Scottish tool is actually the PARDA tool, so it's the pressure ulcer. What was the passion? D-U-R-D-A. Yeah. yeah. It's the, the pressure, pressure ulcer recording. Uh, D-U-D-R-R, the yeah. pressure ulcer daily risk assessment tool. Sorry. Yeah, they changed it. Initially. Oh, it's wow. just, it's hot off the press. Right. We just, uh, uh, somebody from Scotland has just um, presented that. Yeah. It was purer tool, yeah. but they put in the D because yeah. it's about the daily. I think they yeah. found it very Yeah, so originally it was a pressure ulcer risk assessment tool and the felt it incorporated the skin assessment as well as the risk, so they felt that that should be done on a daily basis, and I think that's very important. So that's part of school tool, even is up on the NHS Scotland website. It's a, it's a very simple one-page document, yeah. which you know to really make it. And um, it's definitely something we'll be looking at um, over the coming months. Okay, we haven't really, I suppose, talked about the in the event um, of I suppose the actual treatment or the how do you avoid? So maybe it's a couple of tips of how often do you need to be repositioned? Okay, so that's uh, the advice for that as long as a piece of string. Um, there is a minimum repositioning requirement, um, but every patient's tissue tolerance, and what we mean by that is the ability of someone to tolerate pressure um, is different, because if it wasn't, it would mean that you'd assume everyone in a wheelchair or everyone with limited mobility would develop a pressure sore. So it's about um, looking at your patient and coming back again to see was your treatment that you initiated effective or was your management plan effective. So I think, Pat, and I'm not sure how you feel about that, that you know, when you instigate a plan that you go back at least within two hours and see is this patient's skin reddening or are they tolerating that? And, and some patients can tolerate a reposition change two hourly, others three hourly, others can extend four hourly, but again, it depends, and nursing time is valuable. So by doing that assessment, you, 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 you get a good understanding of the patient's tissue tolerance. And obviously, if they become sick or get better, it, it, it likewise it happens as well, I think. And I, what would you say, Pat? I, I agree, and I, I also think we underestimate the value of the small moves. So, you know, in ever so slight tilt, our use of your electronic bed, if they have sitting forward, if the patient is sitting out, Little movements really do make a, a big difference. So being conscious, I think, of it, I don't think you can literally prescribe and say, um, we should do it every hour, we should do it every two hours. And you, you make that decision really based on your assessment. Um, because sleep for patients is, is as important. So you have to look at the surface they're on. And if they're on a dynamic alternating surface, you may get longer at nighttime. You may get three, four uh, hours at night. Whereas if they're on a static mattress, you would have to consider um, you know, how much can they tolerate. So it, it's very much based on your assessment um, and, and uh, on the individual. Okay, so we have a comment here from Breed Corrigan. She's saying, currently we report SDTI. However, how do we monitor these as patients move on to other facilities? The incident form is completed, but often the patient has moved on, and often this type of pressure damage can take many weeks to resolve. That's yeah, a really good question. And I think, um, unfortunately, from an acute sector moving out to a community nursing home, um, all you can do is document what you see, and, and that's why I think really the change in terminology is really important, because we're describing what we see and we can't predict, because we can't see under the skin, so we can't predict that this is going to become a grade three or a grade four, or indeed it's just bruising that's going to resolve. So I, I don't think anyone would offer to bring the patient back for 10 days' time to see a pressure out there. But I do think, and, and, and indeed if it goes to a four, then they'll need some acute intervention, so maybe they might come back to you. But in the absence of that, I think our new descriptor really allows you to document this damage and then you're covered. What do you think? Pat? Yeah, I think so. And also if somebody is being transferred on to, you know, a community hospital, a nursing home or to another hospital indeed, then how you know, the documentation we transfer with that patient is absolutely key. So we must really labor the importance of, you know, managing the tissue, observing the tissue, seeing for changes, you know, seeing if it is improving. And if not acting within a reasonable period of time to make sure that the facility where this occurred 
you know, if it's in the acute sector, if the patient is referred back um, for ongoing management. So, and, and these are things that are happening and changing. We're learning ourselves in terms of in the past, you know, there was a, a, a culture of blame, you know, it happened there and now we're left with it. But things like that are changing. So once it's reported, there is a, a responsibility on, on the facility where it occurred to, to, to ensure that there is a plan of care and that there is a plan to follow the individual up if possible. Okay, great. I'm going to give everyone online uh, another minute or two for those last minute burning questions there, if you have any, anything else that you want to ask. Um, I just find it very alarming, actually, that 34.5% of uh, pressurosis were related to medical devices. Yeah. Um, is there any particular interventions or things that can flag that up or maybe hopefully lead to improvement in that area? Well, again, I think a lot of it is about um, recording, because unless you record and report, you can't do anything about it. And, and we strongly feel that you know, there is some onus on the companies that supply the equipment to, you know, develop it to meet the needs of the patients. But if we're not reporting problems with it, then they're not going to make any adaptation. So I think that's a very much higher, greater aspect of this. And from a local level, we need to, you know, a lot of these patients have, you know, in ICU, we need to look at, you know, the quality of you know, the, 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 the goods we use, like especially CPAP masks, BiPAP masks, and they can cause huge problems. But sometimes something as simple as putting a silicone strip under a BiPAP mask, whilst you're still getting all of your pressure without leading to leaks sometimes. Or you can even, you know, change to a full head mask, so there's no pressure on the nose at all. It's tied around the head there and there. Like, it's just kind of maybe stop for a minute and think, well, is there absolutely nothing we can do? Um, and I know, um, again, Joyce Black strongly, in, in she's very passionate about medical devices in, in the U.S., you know, and she would go as far as to say that, you know, um, the ET tube should be changed at least once every shift. So, yes, there's lots we can do, but we won't do it unless we start recognizing that we have a problem. And I think the statistics really show that it is a huge problem um, and we need to start talking about it more. And I suppose the other thing there is well, you know, if we look back, going back, going back 10 or 15 years, in fact, I'm not sure is it that we have more now or is it just that we have got better at assessment reporting yeah. and yeah. Um, yeah. because, you know, I would say, oh, we didn't really have any problems with the uh, 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 tracheostomy tubes and that going back in the day. Well, we probably did, but we didn't actually look at them as being pressure related. Yeah. And we started to, I mean, I mean, we were looking at, yeah, I think well, so, yeah. yeah, and I think we started looking at things like Thomas was saying, yeah. you know, the first time that, you know, somebody developed pressure out from that, you know, we were quite shocked, we mm -hmm. associated pressure with bottom or whatever. So I think it's because we are better actually at assessing and, and reporting now that mm -hmm. the percentage is probably yes. at 34%. Yeah, very interesting point. And just actually Catherine. Hansen has asked about the medical device related pressure injuries. Are these given a particular grade or is there? They are. If they're, they, it follows the exact same grading. So if it's local, if it's a grade one, it's red damage, it's the same, exact same grading system. But it's just to be aware of, especially around the nose and around your earlobes um, from oxygen and that, that sometimes, you know, because it's a small area and it's a small wound, we think it's very superficial. When in actual fact, it can be quite superficial quite deep and full thickness uh, and it can have a serious impact on the patient from a pain perspective as well. So yes, you report them as a pressure grade category stage in, as per your normal, but you say they're related to a medical device and um, that's the only difference with them. And you treat them the same um, as you would a pressure ulcer. Great, thanks a million, Gillian. So uh, we have Shania Dennehy uh, in relation to community care, she's um, assess clients low risk or medium high risk, is there a guideline to how often we should reassess these clients? I know a holistic assessment will provide some information and a lot of variants make it difficult to affirm uh, a definite time. Okay, so according to the guidelines, you need, it, it, the, the guidelines are right here for within the hospital, the acute sector is within six hours. In the community sector, it is uh, in the guidelines that somebody should be assessed at their first visit. So when you're going to see your patient for the first time in the community, the assessment should take place at that time. And thereafter about reassessment is based very much 
and what you find at that first assessment. So if you feel the person is at risk, then you have to tailor a plan that will, you know, will, will allow for reassessment more regularly. So it, 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 it's very individualized. You can't really say it, um, you know, that this is a policy everyone should have a reassessment at, at uh, you know, two days or three days. It really comes down to the individual. It comes down to the home setting and the, the props that people have, the cares that they have, you know, what age do they have and so forth. So you base it really on that. So it's clinical judgment. Everything comes back really to clinical judgment, I think, and watching what you're doing and seeing if, if the person is responding. Yeah. And it's like consciously looking at them and listening mm -hmm. to them and, and taking everything into place mm -hmm. because if you just look and, and, and think, oh, they're at risk and do nothing about it again, you need to talk to them. How do they feel? Do they know anything about mm -hmm. pressure ulcers? Do they know that they're at risk? It's amazing the amount of patients who don't actually know they're at risk or never heard of a pressure ulcer unless they have someone they know who had one. So it's, it's really about engaging in your patient and using your clinical skills, your intuition, and your basic skin assessments and, you know, to decide, you know, how often, how much at risk this patient is and then to act on it instead of just, you know, leaving it for the next person. So I think you, we can't give timelines, but it's very important to know that your clinical decision and to pass this on to the next person that comes and they might make a different decision, but it may not be because they know any better. It may be because the patient has become sick or conversely, they've become better. So I suppose communication between um, carers and people that come out to these patients as well as the patients is, is very important. Uh, one thing maybe to ask would be, you know, in terms of uh, at what stage does one, like a, a person who's working in the community, for example, need to seek expert advice? You know, if they're if they are worried or concerned, mm, um, that's a very good question. And again, I think it comes back to assessment because you know, very often, you know, in the community, you can you can do everything right, do your assessment, do your reassessment, but you know, and and sometimes it's hard to strike a balance because you know, patients may not engage. Um, and ultimately, if they don't want to do it, that's patient choice. Mm -hmm. So we can, you can provide all the information um, and, and so forth. So if it gets to a point like that, where um, despite all the measures being in place, or you know, an individual choosing otherwise, then they have to be have the capacity to refer on to a specialist, you know, to a either a wound uh, to a TBN or an AMP at the earliest possible time that they're concerned. So if there's a deterioration or if there is non-progression in terms of, of uh, towards any type of, of healing, that really they shouldn't leave it beyond, we would really say non-progression for two to four weeks, then you have to be referring on where you have all the measures in place. And from a patient's perspective, for them even to know when do they seek advice and they ask us of having no care facilities. Um, I don't think that will happen much unless you have a very informed patient or we've done so much with pub publicly that it becomes more of a public health awareness mm -hmm. so that patients know they're at risk and even patients who are at risk, like high at risk, come into us and, and feel they're not at risk mm -hmm. and, you know, and, it's, and, and it's that lack of information and they'll only get that information through public campaigns and through us calling in on them or I think very important people that we sometimes forget about is the GP or the practice nurse and um, that they have a huge role to play in you know advising patients of where they need to go as well. Okay we have two more questions and I think we'll have to round it up after that. So from um, Bandana, I'm not sure sorry now about the, the pronouncing of that but what is the best practice for wound measurement? Okay that's I, and I suppose it's, this is very timely because the guidelines, the national guidelines that have just been updated will be coming out at the end of this month on the HSC website and hopefully by the end of the year everyone have a copy um, and it deals with measurement. So again, there is no absolute, there is no, you know, there is no way you can say um, that is the right or the wrong way, I suppose, because there are so many different tools that can be used. But in the, the most simple, it would probably be where you measure using a clock, head to toe. So your, 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 your measure length and your measure width. So it's from 12 o'clock to 6 o'clock. 
and from 9 o'clock to 3 o'clock. Now, often, and I only saw it yesterday in practice, where somebody wanted to go diagonally because that was the lo longest part of the wound. But in fact, if you use a consistent, it's both consistency and standardizing is really, if you use a consistent method, 12 to 6 to 93, over a period of time, you can actually measure if, if it is responding. Whereas if you go diagonally and the next person comes back and does it um, according to the clock, you're going to get um, a, a different measurement. So that's one way and probably I would say in the absence of a lot of tools is probably a very reliable uh, standard. The second way is by using a uh, tracer. So when you put um, some type of parchment that has uh, a grid on it uh, down onto the wound itself and trace it as an outline, you get an actual centimeter squared of the wound. And that is probably a lot more accurate because if you continue to use the tracer, you get the actual reduction in centimeter squared. So you will get a much better idea because if you use the 12 to 6 system, mm -hmm. you can miss out on, on, on the other sites. But the thing about the grid system is, is that doesn't consider undermining tunneling or, or sinuses. So, you know, each has a part. So probably the grid are the, are the measuring um, with, from 12 to 6. Using a depth indicator to, for the undermining areas would be the best system at the moment. Yeah. And it's important then that you measure on initial assessment and, and true, all the way through. So that you know that you start off somewhere, that you're not just going to start measuring it in the middle of a wound. Um, and the breed has just asked actually it links in nicely there. What do you think of the use of a camera in the ED department for staff to photograph the pressure of gun admission? Uh, again, that's a huge contentious issue because you have multiple factors to think of. <laughs> a, firstly and foremostly, it's consent. And is your patient capable of giving consent? Um, privacy, dignity. Um, is this a department camera? Where are you going to keep the pictures? What quality are your images? Is the person trained? Like, so for a lot of like skin conditions where you need um, proper photography, you would actually have a clinical photographer to take these pictures. So, you know, there's a certain distance you stand from a wound. So really, it's, it's obviously we have clinical photographers, I think. I, it, it's a very, um, t you know, tenuous, thing to do and it's becoming more difficult. You know, there's a there is a natural H B consent policy and photography is in it. But we don't really if you describe the wound and um, use dimensions, it's nearly just as good because sometimes the quality of your picture, you can't see depth, you can't see colour. So we don't advocate it. Sometimes we use it, but it you know, you have to consent and then you have to consent to the patient or their family and then who's looking at these images and where are they being stored and you know, there are all of those kind of issues. I, I, I like to take photographs actually, whether it's in the emergency department or whatever, um, but really for the sole purpose of informing myself so that when I go back, and so I have no, nothing to identify anybody on it, and I get consent for the service, um, but I find it very good and sometimes the patient will say, you know, it's not getting any better. And so I find it useful in that say, well, actually it is, and you're able to show them. But I am very careful around it, and, and I think we should all be very careful, uh, policy uh, and so forth, unless it's a, an official clinical photographer. Because in the case of a, a court of law, I'm not quite sure mm -hmm. um, how you would go in terms of even presenting that, you yeah. know, unless you had, and did the patient present every time. Yeah, um, right. I don't even think it's admissible it. in a court yeah. of law because I, you yeah. have to prove that you've done a court yeah. that yeah. makes you yeah. um, you know, able. So you might tell them you're taking a picture as a path does, but that could be because it's path mm -hmm. of the who does it all the time. It's the same person taking the photo. Whereas if you go willy nilly at it, you're, you know, you're, there's a lot of issues that can spring from it. Like and it can yeah. be very subjective and then it could, might, may not hold up in the court law. Or it could indeed look a lot worse than it is. Mm -hmm. So they're the things you have to think about when you're, when you're devising that policy. So it might be, uh, it, it might, might be better be. to just stare clear <laughs> yeah. for the moment. For the moment. Yeah. 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 Um, so thanks, actually, Sinead, she just said thanks a minute for your help, uh, for your help, a very helpful talk as we are currently developing a local pressure also policy. Brilliant, that's great, good to know. There's one other final question just to come back to. Um, is there a skin assessment tool in the updated wound care policy? That's from Sinead. I think there is in the, in the back of, and actually for you updating Sinead, your policies, 
the national wound care guidelines, which contain everything pertaining to wounds, including pressure ulcers, will have huge detail in it and maybe very good appendix. It's, it's a very good um, appendix to have in your policy. So, um, and especially when we're waiting for official confirmation from the clinical risk about indemnity. So maybe I maybe whilst you're doing your policy, mm -hmm. just be aware that you know we'll have a national risk mandate of how we report now as well, as well as our new wound care guidelines. So you don't want to be starting something that actually may or may, may change. And the staging definitely is. Like we've, we've given you the new stages, but that has to be produced in the, the department's um, document, and that will be out soon. So rather than you, you know, you're going to have to change some stuff, basically. So maybe get ready for to insert new new chapters. And there are good tools uh, in the book. Yeah, skin is. assessment is very well yeah. covered in the new guidelines, yeah. and there are some very good appendices, appendices that can be uh, used and referenced uh, in the back. Yeah, yeah. So good luck on that. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, great. Um, well, thank you very much to everybody there online for all of your interaction and your questions that's made for a very interactive session. And thanks very much to Gillian and Pat for all of their, um, just making sure. Pat, I worked with Mary Conroy. Great to hear the Cork accent. Yeah. <laughs> okay, very thank good. You. Uh, okay, uh, thanks very much again for joining. And I'm just actually going to share with you uh, from the Quality Improvement Division, we have a framework for improving quality, which is really good to apply to any type of document that you're doing in terms of guidance and also an knowledge and improve improvement guide. And, and uh, thanks, girls. And lastly, just to say to you, QI Talk Time is actually on every second Tuesday. It's, uh, you know, loads of different talks on really aimed at quality improvement and around the framework for improving quality. So if you look at all the drivers, we have leadership, we have measurement, we have governance. We touch on all of those things and give you tools and ideas that you can use when you're doing any quality improvement project. So the next webinar is on Tuesday with Peter Lackman, who is the chair, CEO of the International Society for Quality uh, in Healthcare. So he's going to talk to us on leading for quality. So hopefully some of you can uh, tune back in then again. If you want to be on the um, the mail shot for the QI talk time, you can email myself, roisin.breen at hsc.e or Naomi Palacios, uh, I think it's how you pronounce it, at hsc.ie. So thanks a million and thanks again to Gillian and Pat um, for that. This will be available online if you want to share this with your colleagues on um, the hsc qualityimprovement.ie QI talk time page. So please share that uh, with any of your colleagues that you think might be interested. Thank you very much. No problem.